Today on episode 77, I'm going to take you through lesson planning from the big picture at 30,000 feet to the day-to-day -day on the ground. I hear from so many of you that lesson planning is literally the bane of your existence and that it stresses you out so much. I mean, there are already a billion things to think about aside from sitting down planning lessons. Plus, your teacher prep program may have covered it, but now that you're with your own students, you don't necessarily know what to do. So today we're going to tackle that and I'm going to give you a peek into my thought process when I plan. Welcome to the teacher's need. Oh. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive their first few years, but actually thrive. Thanks for joining me today and letting me share all of my mistakes I've made and wisdom I've gleaned over these past 18 years. I love helping new teachers as much as I love teaching my students. And I suspect that if you're here listening now, you're a newer teacher who's looking for some help. So welcome. Today's topic was inspired by a survey that I sent out with the previous episode. I told you guys that I take your feedback and suggestions seriously, which is why the survey was necessary. If you haven't filled it out yet, I'd like to invite you to do that so that I can keep producing episodes that will help you become a better teacher, make you feel better about teaching, and answer all of the burning questions that you may be too embarrassed or busy to ask. So head on over to teachersneedteachers.com forward slash survey and take a moment to complete that. I promise it'll be worth your time. So again, that's teachersneedteachers.com slash survey. Okay, my computer is being wonky. I'm getting the spinning wheel of death. So some of you may remember me mentioning this before, but when I switched from teaching band to English, I had a friend, and her name is Deb, who gave me everything she ever used to teach seventh grade English. She actually vouched for me when we were convincing my principal to let me switch over. Deb ended up switching to eighth grade English and I took her spot. And since she was such a strong teacher, I definitely wanted everything that she ever used to teach so that I wouldn't have to start from scratch. And I cannot express enough how helpful it was to have all of her materials. I mean, we're talking about the full year. It gave me an idea of what I should be teaching, how to teach it, how long I should take, and what to expect from my seventh grade students. Over time, I tweaked those lessons based on my teaching style and student population, and eventually I stopped using her lessons. But they were a really good basis for figuring out how to teach English. What I didn't get from the beginning was a big picture view of where my students needed to go. Because of this, they could do random skills well, but not enough to put them together successfully and produce a quality product. So today I want to go over how to do that so that your lessons and planning don't feel aimless and haphazard. So we're going to start out with mapping out the year by starting with the end in mind. So here's some things that you're going to need to start this out with. You're going to want to use just a regular monthly calendar that shows the days in each month, so not like a, a daily planner. Something that you can look at from afar so you can see big picture. And then you want to take out any curriculum or pacing guides that you must use, plus a list of your content level standards. On your calendar, you're going to start out by writing out the holidays and breaks and other non-student days. And it's not just so that you can celebrate your time, your time off, but also so that you can see where there's going to be breaks in the learning. And I find this is important because if there's something major that I want them to know, I'm not going to teach it to them right before a break so that they can forget it. And then also you want to write down any finals that you may have, other assessments, and also state testing. So the next thing you're going to do is you are going to decide which skills 
are the most important. Notice I didn't say standards. That comes later. First, I want you to get really clear on what you want your students to be able to demonstrate knowledge of and skill in. For me, I focus on writing and literary analysis standards. I want my students to be able to write what we call a race paragraph, which is restate, answer, cite, and explain. And I want them to be able to do it either for literature or nonfiction, or actually for both. I want them to have a solid topic sentence for each body paragraph, evidence that directly supports the topic sentence, and an explanation of how each piece of evidence supports and is relevant to the topic. And I want them to write an introduction that contains a hook, a preview of the topic, and a thesis statement. So those are just my top writing skills, and there are obviously some literature ones, but I'm not going to go into those right now. In real life, I want my students to be able to communicate their thoughts effectively through writing, which means that I want them to write coherent sentences, stay away from too many cliches and idioms, support their thoughts and assertions with evidence, explain why the reader should care, use higher level and content specific vocabulary when necessary, and do all of that in a coherent way. So to me, basically, if they can do all of that in a variety of situations, especially the ones that aren't in English, then I feel like I've succeeded. So my point is that you need to write down what you want your students to be able to walk away doing well. When they leave your grade and move on to the next, what do you want the next teacher to marvel at what your students can do? What do they need to be able to do in order to be successful in your next grade. Nope, I didn't like that. What do they need to do in order to be successful in the next grade? And as teachers, we continuously pass the baton to the next teacher in our subject, so we have to be sure to properly prepare them for what's next. So really get your head around what your students should be able to do by the end of the year then think about how you want them to demonstrate that. Maybe some kind of culminating project or summative assessment, and you'll most likely want to do this multiple times a year. I like to have something once a quarter so that I can continually assess their progress. Some of you may already be thinking that this task can be some sort of multiple guess test. Notice I said multiple guess. I challenge you to think beyond that and choose something where students demonstrate thinking like a professional in your subject area. This means that they can think like a historian and demonstrate it. Think like a scientist and demonstrate it. Think like someone who uses math every day and demonstrate it. Then you look at the standards and you hone in on the ones that are necessary to complete these culminating tasks. You and I know that not all the standards are equally important. You want to choose the ones that you know need repeating and building throughout the year so that they can reach the, that ultimate goal before the end of the year. Below each summative assignment, write down all of the necessary standards that you have to teach in order for your students to successfully complete that assignment. So we're working from this culminating project and then backwards to the standards. And the beautiful thing is that you'll be repeating or spiraling certain standards, the most important ones. And hopefully those are the ones that other teachers also see as being important in your subject area. And after you've done that, take a look at what's left over. And I will be completely honest and admit that I don't get to every standard. And many of my colleagues are in the same boat. And it's not that we're lazy, it's just that there are so many more important things to do and that we want to teach in depth rather than just taking a tour of all of the standards. You can probably squeeze some of the other standards in something like a bell ringer, something maybe on a minimum day or you know something like that where you can just spend maybe five or ten minutes on it. For example, I really don't have time to dive into affixes, but it's a standard I need to cover. So once in a while my students will see these in their warm-ups and I'll sneak in a quick mini lesson. 
and I in no way feel guilty about this and neither should you. What if you're new and you have no idea what students should be able to do? Well, that's simple. Just ask. Ask your colleagues in your department. Take to Twitter and social media and ask. Go on Teachers Pay Teachers and see what types of activities other... Mm, nope. You could go on Teachers Pay Teachers and see what types of activities other teachers in your same grade and subject are doing. While you'll get a variety of answers, this will at least give you some ideas. I have some colleagues who are very reading heavy, literature heavy, and spend the majority of time studying novels. They write as needed to complete analysis, but writing happens instead of it being the focus. And I, on the other hand, am very writing focused, and the readings revolve around the writing. I prefer short stories so that students have opportunities to practice writing for different situations. And this is because I like the repetition of skills within the context and have personally found that there are fewer opportunities to do that if you spend all this time on a class novel. So I just prefer short stories. So once you've figured out your culminating activities, what you want them to do, you want to put that down in your calendar. You kind of want to map out how you're going to space this out. And then after that, you're going to figure out which standards that you need to cover in order to provide the adequate instruction so that students can demonstrate those skills needed to do the culminating project. Okay. And then we're going to break it down into units. So the next part is figuring how you're going to teach those standards that lead to the skills. So you want to start with entire units of study. For me, one short story will be a unit of study. I'll decide within each short story what I want them to be able to learn and demonstrate and which previous skills will be repeated. So I slightly review something we've done before like writing or the race format and then I'll add levels of complexity to that. I was lucky to have Deb's sort resources but if I were starting out teaching English right now this year I would immediately take to teachers pay teachers. That was terrible. Now I was lucky enough to have Deb's resources, but if I were starting out teaching English right now this year, I would immediately take to Teachers Pay Teachers. Some of you feel compelled to create everything because you only have the boring worksheets from your curriculum. And you know, it's ridiculously stressful to recreate everything. Now, there are so many Reese's resort. Mm. And now there are so many resources that you can supplement or even eventually re replace what you have in your curriculum. If you like what's provided for you, then definitely use those. You don't have to get everything from Teachers Pay Teachers. But I'm telling you guys right now, I urge you not to try to write new lessons. This may be a controversial statement, but as I've mentioned before, when you're starting out, you don't know what works and what doesn't. So use other people's lessons, whether it's with your textbook or from a colleague, and spend your energy focusing on delivering the lessons smoothly on classroom management, on being engaging, on checking for understanding, on pacing, pretty much on giving the lesson. And after a couple times of using that lesson, you'll be able to determine if the thinking and method behind it is sound, if it works for your population, or if you'll need to tweak and scrap it. But I really recommend not creating everything from scratch your first few years. I, I can't say this enough. Nobody, and I mean nobody, will judge you for using other people's lessons and ideas. So back to bring, breaking it down into units. Remember that you have your big culminating activities, and before that you need larger units with their own smaller culminating activity, and then lessons within those units to teach and practice the skill. 
For me, we have a culminating activity in November where students have to write an informal essay. The essay needs to have an introduction, two to three body paragraphs, and a conclusion. So in my PLC, we start out with teaching how to write the body paragraphs, which involves teaching them the race writing format. Our students will first do a pre-assessment just so we can get a feel for their writing. And then we dive into reading both fiction and nonfiction texts where we practice answering questions and pulling out evidence to support our answers. So we're starting small, looking at the evidence. And after practicing that, we then teach them the race formats so that they can see how all of that evidence and everything else goes together. And then we practice the race format for a while before moving on to writing introductions. Do you see how we break up each part going from simple to more complex? But in order to get to the daily lessons, I first had to work backwards. Sorry. For each step, I had to ask, what do my students need to know and be able to do in order to successfully do this on their own? When I came up with the skills, I asked the same question for each of those skills. So you have to go backwards, backwards, backwards. Then you find lessons to teach those skills. Some can be you know, taught together, some need multiple lessons or days, while others are quick. This is why I suggest you use other people's lessons that have been tested so that you can focus on pacing and checking for understanding. So next I want to talk about how to decide how to teach the skill. So you're finally ready to break it down into what you do day by day. We figured out the big culminating project or you can call it a summative assessment. We figured out the units of study and now we need to figure out what we're going to put on our calendar every single day. And so for the summative assessments, nope. If you're heeding my advice, you're not creating these daily lessons, but are instead using other people's lessons. You want to guesstimate how long each lesson will take and see what you can fit in. Since you're just starting out, you want to definitely over plan each day, I'm sure you've heard of this, with the intent of moving the last activity to the next day. So if you had three activities, you want that third one to be the one that you'll only do if you have extra time. Otherwise the plan is to have that third activity be the first activity the next day or you can add another activity on the same skill or a review of the previous skill. So that could be what you do if you guys get done early. Either way, have more than what you think you need. Also, decide when you're going to give a formative or informal assessment. This is basically just checking to see if you can move on. It doesn't have to be something that they're turning in and I really don't recommend putting this in the gradebook. I really don't believe that students should be penalized for practicing a skill. I, I don't understand this at all when I hear about this from other teachers. Can you imagine if whether or not you win the Super Bowl depends on how you did in practice? Or if your teacher pay was tied to the grades you got in your teacher prep program or even just your undergrad in general? So I don't understand why students are being penalized for that day-to-day -day practice when they're still learning the skill. Anyway, when you're deciding on which lessons to use, ask yourself whether or not the lesson actually gives students an opportunity to practice the skill. I've seen worksheets where students have to fill in the blank based on a textbook or a presentation. So a teacher will lift a paragraph from the textbook, take out some of the words, and have that be the exercise. And while it may ensure that they're paying attention, it's kind of a waste of mental energy and time. Look for lessons where they can have some practice but then apply what they just practiced. Also, you don't have to have students do all of the exercises. If there are 20 questions and your students are getting it in only 10, 
you don't have to have them complete and everything. Or maybe what you can do is save those other 10 for them to do as a review later. And decide which assignments will actually count toward the grade and are indicators of learning, individual learning, versus just practice. Remember that in past episodes, I've warned against grading everything. Just assess over their shoulder during class time and practice and grade the stuff that really has them demonstrate the skill on their own. And then before you teach a lesson, this is really important, have at least two days worth of materials ready just in case they finish early. So really quick during the lesson, I think this is also important, you know, you might be wondering, well, is lesson delivery actually part of lesson planning? You bet it is. You have to constantly assess throughout the lesson whether or not it's going as planned, how your students are doing, if they're staying engaged, whether or not the students can do some of the exercises independently, if it's taking longer than you'd planned, or if they're flying through everything. When you're ready to teach the lesson, have an outline written down for what Nope. When you're ready to teach the lesson, have an outline written down that you can refer to and be aware of what students are struggling with or that they're getting right away. So the entire time you're taking this informal data in your head of how students are doing. You're not just delivering the lesson and they are receivers of the information. You want to deliver some of it, check, read the room, look at their reactions, see how fast they're getting it. If people are answering out loud and their answers are wrong, then you gotta, you know, regroup and figure out a new way to teach it. So, you know, if they're struggling, slow down, reteach, add more, I do, we do, you do. Maybe you had planned on them doing, you know, just like five of the problems with you and then the rest on their own. Well, maybe you need to do more of them or add another five where they do that with their group members. You know, if their attention is lagging, added more cooperative le learning or think, pair, share right on the spot. If they're getting frustrated, regroup and reteach. If they're just flying through everything, don't give them all of the exercises. Move on, which you can do since you have the next day's materials. And after each day, take a few minutes to write down what did and didn't work. Now Deb taught me to write on a post-it what to keep and change for next time. That way when I'm planning next year, I'll know ahead of time and I won't make those same mistakes. I now do this in the notes app on my computer if I'm teaching something new. So I know that this was a lot to take in, but I think it's really important. You can beg, borrow, or buy lesson plans, but knowing how to put them together in a cohesive way is another monster. I really, really wish that I had known how to do this when I started out. And since I'm still encouraging you to use other people's lessons, knowing how to put together the pieces to complete the puzzle is all you need to focus on in the beginning. So again, I really don't suggest you focus on creating new lessons from scratch. I think that you should focus on delivering ready-made lessons that are tried and true. And as you teach and become comfortable with this and you have your yearly mapping done, you can start to see what you need your lessons to be based on for your students and your style of teaching. Then you can start creating your own or using other people's lessons as an inspiration or a launching point. I did that with some of Deb's lessons. So if you get this big picture stuff down first, your ability to really improve your students' knowledge and abilities in your class will be awesome. That just sounds really dumb. So if you get this down, this big picture stuff down first, then you're really gonna be able to move your students forward and they're gonna end up being more successful year after year. Now, I'll go over how to plan an individual lesson in a future episode, but for now, you can actually go to episode 27 where I interview Laura Keybart and we discuss how to plan with differentiation in mind. It's a fabulous episode and I definitely suggest that you take a listen to that in addition to this one. 
So I hope that you found today's packed episode useful and don't forget to complete the survey if you haven't yet. It's at teachersneedteachers.com forward slash survey. Thanks for making it to the end, you guys. Have a fabulous week.